Hello, friends. Welcome to the National Constitution Center and to today's convening of America's Town Hall. I'm Jeffrey Rosen, the president and CEO of the National Constitution Center, and we're thrilled to co-host today's program with ADL. Uh, ADL is doing such crucially important work combating anti-Semitism, fighting hate for good, as its mission statement says, and it's an honor to partner with them on this annual Supreme Court review. I'd like to thank Eileen Hershenov, Senior Vice President of Democracy Initiatives, Stephen Freeman, Vice President of Civil Rights and Director of Legal Affairs, Karen Levitt, National Civil Rights Council, and the rest of the great ADL team for convening such a distinguished panel and for our continued collaboration. Let's inspire ourselves for the discussion ahead, uh, as we always do at the beginning of our programs, by reciting together the National Constitution Center's mission statement. Here we go. The National Constitution Center is the only institution in America chartered by Congress to increase awareness and understanding of the Constitution among the American people on a nonpartisan basis. We have lots of wonderful programs and platforms where you can continue to learn about the Constitution on a nonpartisan basis in the months ahead, including our We the People podcast, our Constitution 101 class online, and our incredible interactive Constitution that brings together America's leading liberal and conservative thought leaders to discuss every clause of the Constitution. And now it is a great pleasure to turn things over to Marjorie Zesser, Chair of ADL's Legal Affairs Committee, to begin the program. Enjoy the conversation ahead. Thank you very much. Welcome to the Anti-Defamation League's 24th Annual Supreme Court Review. I'm Marjorie Zesser, Chair of ADL's Legal Affairs Committee. This program is presented jointly with the National Constitution Center. We are grateful to our partners there, Jeffrey Rosen, Tania Tabar, Lana Ulrich, and John Guerra. Before we hear from our distinguished panelists, I want to recognize our National Civil Rights Chair, Rachel Robbins, our Vice Chair, Jared Lindauer, ADL's outgoing Senior Vice President, Democracy Initiatives, Eileen Hershenoff, and ADL Senior Counsel and Director of Legacy, Steve Freeman, who Jeff also recognized. I also want to thank our National Civil Rights Counsel, Karen Levitt, and Marketing Manager, Samantha College, for their work coordinating this event. We have set aside time at the end for substantive questions. Simply submit them via the Q&A feature. ADL was founded in 1913 with the mission to stop the defamation of the Jewish people and to secure justice and fair treatment to all. We filed amicus briefs in many of the key cases you will hear about today. Links to those briefs are included in the materials for this program and are available on ADL's event website, along with bios of our brilliant presenters. Let me introduce them now. Erwin Chemerinsky is the Dean of Berkeley Law. He frequently argues appellate cases, including in the US Supreme Court. He's the author of 15 books and more than 200 law review articles. Miguel Estrada is a partner in the Washington DC office of Gibson, Don and Crutcher. He has argued 24 cases before the US Supreme Court. He previously served as deputy chief of the appellate section, US Attorney's Office, Southern District of New York. Gregory Garr is a partner in the Washington, D.C. office of Latham and Watkins and chair of the firm's Supreme Court and appellate practice. He previously served as the 44th Solicitor General of the United States. He has argued 48 cases before the Supreme Court. Frederick Lawrence is the 10th Secretary and CEO of the Phi Beta Kappa Society. Fred is also a distinguished lecturer at Georgetown Law Center. He is the author of Punishing Hate, Bias Crimes Under American Law. Dahlia Lithwick is a senior editor at Slate, where she covers the Supreme Court and jurisprudence and hosts the amazing podcast, Amicus. Her new book, Lady Justice, was an instant, instant New York Times bestseller. And finally, our moderator, Amy Howe, runs the website How on the Court and writes for SCOTUS blog, for which she previously served as editor and reporter. She has served as counsel in over two dozen merits cases at the Supreme Court and argued two cases there. Amy, take it away. Thanks so much, Marjorie. Um, thanks so much to NCC and ADL for inviting me back this year as the moderator 
Uh, I'm delighted to be here because it means that I get to listen as well to all of these incredibly talented people. Uh, with another big term at the Supreme Court, we could easily spend the entire hour and a half talking about any one of these cases. Instead, we're going to spend it talking about uh, more than uh, a dozen of them. But we're going to start with Irwin, who's going to sort of take a look at the term from the 35,000 foot level. So Irwin, take it away, please. Thank you. It's an enormous pleasure to be part of the program again. It was another momentous term in the court. I want to make a few overviews to get us started. First, I want to talk about the term by the numbers and what they mean. The Supreme Court decided 58 cases with signed opinions after briefing oral argument. It's exactly the same number as a year ago. Two years ago, the court decided 54 cases, and the year before that, it was 52 cases, which was the smallest number since 1862. It seems the court has now stabilized the deciding 50-some cases a year. That's a significant decrease from the past. For the first decade of the Roberts Court, they were averaging over 70 cases a year. And William Rehnquist last year as chief, October term 2004, the court decided 80 cases. And in the 1980s, not that long ago, the court was averaging 160 cases a year. Of the 58 cases decided this term, 47% were resolved unanimously. That's dramatically more than the 28% of the cases that were unanimous a year ago. But if you look at the last decade, the court has averaged 43% of the cases being unanimous, so it's not out of line with that. I think the degree of unanimity is probably more a function of the cases on the docket than a desire for consensus. This year, there were 11 six to three decisions, a year ago, there were 18 six to three decisions, and the number six, five to four decisions this year. Overall, the conservative position prevailed in many of the most important cases, but there were more notable liberal victories than a year ago. I think of the last two days of the term, June 29th and 30th, when the Supreme Court handed down conservative decisions with regard to ending affirmative action, invalidating the Biden student loan program and allowing individuals to violate state anti-discrimination laws on account of their beliefs. But we'll also talk about decisions where the liberal position prevailed, like in finding that Alabama violated the Voting Rights Act, rejecting the independent state legislature theory, and also the court upholding the Indian Child Welfare Act. I think we saw that it is very much the John Roberts court Brett Kavanaugh was the justice most often in the majority. In non-unanimous cases, he's the majority 90% of the time. John Roberts was second, being in the majority 86% of the time. But Roberts wrote the majority opinion in so many of the most important cases this term. The affirmative action decision, the case with regard to Alabama, the Voting Rights Act, in validating the independent state legislature theory, and also with regard to the student loan cases. The second theme that I'd identify is that I think we're in the era, era of the supreme judiciary. If I had to pick a single theme that unites the cases we're going to talk about today, it's how much the Supreme Court now shows deference to no one. It doesn't defer to the president and the executive branch. We'll see that when we talk about the student loan cases. It doesn't defer to Congress. We talk about the Supreme Court changing the interpretation of Title VII with regard to religious discrimination. Rather than let Congress advise the statute, the court effectively overruled a 46-year-old precedent on its own. It's not a court that defers to the states. Every case that came from state courts was a reversal by the Supreme Court. And we saw the lack of deference to state governments when the Supreme Court said that state anti-discrimination laws must yield to First Amendment beliefs. It's certainly not a court that was deferring to educational administrators. In prior cases and upholding affirmative action, the Supreme Court stressed the need to defer to the judgment of those who run educational institutions. Chief Justice Roberts' opinion in invalidating affirmative action came to exactly the opposite conclusion, saying there should be no deference to their judgment. And it's not a court that defers to the judgment of the predecessor justices. It's not a court that gives much weight to precedent. We saw that a year ago when the Supreme Court overruled Roe versus Wade. We saw it this term 
when the Supreme Court overruled the affirmative action decisions. So it's not a court about judicial minimalism. It's not a court about judicial modesty. As I say, if I had to pick a theme for the term that unites the many cases we'll talk about that were an era of judicial supremacy. Third and final observation, I don't think we can ignore the context in which the Supreme Court is operating right now. The Supreme Court has the lowest approval ratings of its history. A recent Quinnipiac poll had 30% of the population expressing approval for the Supreme Court's performance, 59% expressing disapproval. There were major ethics scandals revealed involving a number of the justices. It's hard to know whether this context affected the decisions this term, hard to know what their impact will be on the court for the future, but I don't think we can talk about this term without keeping that context in mind. Thanks so much, Erwin. I know that our panelists will, will have more to say on these themes as we dive into the cases, which we're gonna do right now. We're gonna start with free speech and religion cases, and in particular with the case of Pennsylvania postal carrier, Gerald Groff. And Dahlia is gonna tell us more about his case and the Supreme Court's decision. So thanks so much to uh, ADL, to the Constitution Center, to this amazing uh, panel. This is always like really, really a capstone uh, to me uh, of the end of any term. And it's really a pleasure to be with all of you. And thanks to everybody uh, who's tuning in. Uh, Gerald Groff is an evangelical Christian who believes uh, that Sundays should be reserved for rest and prayer. He started working uh, for the US Postal Service in 2012. And when the Postal Service entered an agreement to deliver packages for Amazon on Sundays, he was told he couldn't take Sabbath off anymore on Sundays. And he was disciplined when he refused to do that. He resigned in 2019. Uh, as Erwin just told you, Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 provides that employers are required to accommodate the religious practices of their employees only if providing such an accommodation does not present, quote, an undue hardship to their business. And in some sense, Groff is just a case that turns on the meaning of undue hardship uh, in trying to determine the nature of a religious accommodation for a worker. And as Erwin also just told you, in a 1977 case, TWA versus Hardison, the court held that providing a religious accommodation imposed an undue hardship on the employer any time it required the employer to quote, bear more than a de minimis cost. And de minimis, uh, you can tell by the name, means it's a trivial or minor cost. As a result, after Hardison, if an employer could demonstrate that a religious accommodation entailed even a small cost, uh, usually the worker would lose. Justice Thurgood Marshall, furiously dissenting in that case, joined by Justice Brennan, uh, lamented that, quote, despite Congress's best efforts, one of the pillars, this nation's pillars of strength, our hospitality to religious diversity has been seriously eroded. All Americans will be a little poorer until this decision is erased, end quote. And I just want to flag for you that the liberal lions were the furious dissenters in those cases, as opposed to where we are now on religious accommodations tells you the degree to which uh, we live in sort of a topsy-turvy religious accommodations uh, moment. Uh, the Third Circuit analyzed Groff's case, and they felt that employers could establish and quote undue hardship by showing that a religious accommodation would affect other employees or reduce morale. Uh, so Groff loses in the lower courts. Uh, I want to flag here that ADL signed on to an amicus brief in this case, urging the court to adopt a higher standard. Uh, they wanted undue hardship in Title VII to mean what it does under the ADA, quote, significant difficulty or expense. Uh, this is one of the unanimous opinions that Erwin just told you about, uh, Justice Alito writing for the entire court uh, 
Uh, he did not explicitly overrule Hardison, uh, but the court, as Erwin also just told you, essentially rewrote what undue hardship really means under the law. And what it means is that employers must grant religious accommodations unless they can show, quote, substantial increased costs to their business. So Groff's case is now sent back to the lower courts for further proceedings under the new standard because the Third Circuit had relied on the more than de minimis cost standard. Uh, Justice Son Sonia Sotomayor writes a concurring opinion uh, joined by Justice Jackson in which she notes among other things that we need to take into account burdens on other employees. So what's the net effect of Groff? In some sense, it corrects a, a bad precedent, uh, a precedent that was deplored by Thurgood Marshall. Um, under the de minimis standard, as it uh, stood in Hardison, a huge number of negative impacts were felt by religious minorities like Muslims and Sikhs, whose garb and whose observances are, are suspect uh, in uh, Christian dominated workplaces. Under this higher standard, however, it's worth flagging that the court is likely opening the door to a whole different kind of religious objectors, uh, including the Walmart Mart employee who repeatedly told colleagues uh, that LGBTQ uh, uh, folks are going to hell, or a uh, employee at HP who posted Bible uh, verses on his cubicle calling for the execution of gay Americans, or a pharmacist uh, at Walmart who refuses to fill birth control prescriptions uh, under religious conscious objections. So this is in the aggregate, um, and um, we'll hear what Greg has to say, but I think in the aggregate, this is in some sense a fix that might very well help a lot of uh, minority religions. And it may also be part of this larger move to use uh, religious dissenters from certain objecting uh, Christian employees to widen the scope of what is a religious accommodation. Thanks, uh, Dahlia. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, thank you, and thanks to ADL and Constitution Center for having me here. Like the others, I, it's one of the highlights of my year. Um, I, I think you know the only real surprise here is that the opinion was unanimous and so relatively straightforward. And I think that in that respect, this opinion is an example of a theme that we see emerging from this term, which is, you know, the term, the court ended last term literally barricaded um, from the public. And, you know, in, in, in a sense, in a hardened 6-3 um, conservative liberal majority in the wake of the Dobbs decision. And this term, I think we see the justices um, to a large degree trying to find consensus and middle grounds where possible, certainly not in every case, but, but where possible. And here, the justices found a middle ground, uh, one in which everyone could agree, even the justices who are probably um, more aggressive on religious liberty and, and liberals who have, uh, at least in the last few years, um, not been as receptive to these claims. Uh, and they did so without formally overruling uh, their prior precedent, which I think is another um, theme that emerges from this term, uh, unlike last term in the Dobbs case in particular, where the court expressly overruled this precedent. This term, the court, um, I think, notably stayed away from that. And as we'll talk about later, um, certainly there's an argument that they effectively overruled some cases, but they didn't expressly overrule any cases. And in this case, they looked at their prior decision in TWA and said, yeah, there was a line in there that referred to de minimis, something more than de minimis, de minimis. But if you really look at the whole decision, the right way to think about it, and we're clar clarifying it today, is that you have to show, in order to show an undue hardship, you have to show, you know, genuinely substantial burden. Um, despite the fact that this is unanimous, I think it is quite important, and I, I think it's likely to lead to an increase in the number of religious accommodation suits, um, perhaps of the both types that Dahlia described, and, and therefore, you know, more of this kind of uh, litigation, and we'll have to see how this plays out, but it likely will result in additional cases before the court, perhaps in which the court will not be uh, unanimous. Thanks so much. Uh, uh, we're going to move on to a, a different 
case, a different kind of issue, which is the tension between LGBTQ rights and the rights of business owners uh, who are devoutly religious. And that's the case of 303 Creative versus Elenis. And so Miguel is going to introduce that case for us. Thank you. And I start also by thanking ADL and the Constitutional Center for having me. I uh, have known, uh, I think many, if not most of these people uh, for years and years and years, and I love to be in the company of everybody again. So um, this is one of those cases that I got a lot of press and uh, as always, not to be overly harsh on the fourth estate, not in my judgment entirely accurate. Um, you may recall that five years ago, the court in a case called Masterpiece Cake Shop considered the question whether um, it would violate you know, the First Amendment for a state to punish a baker for refusing to bake a wedding cake for a same-sex couple um, when the baker claimed that he had you know, religious objections um, to providing you know, the service. And the state um, was uh, trying to um, enforce a public accommodation law. Um, it was an interesting feature of the case, which is sort of a doctrinal fluke in, uh, in this area, that even though the reason for the Baker's sort of opposition to, uh, to uh, wanting to do this was you know, religious, the claim was a speech claim. And the reason for that is that al although a lay person might think that this is really most naturally a free exercise claim. Um, the Supreme Court in the Smith case held many years ago that under the free exercise clause, generally you are not entitled to a get out of jail free card from the enforcement of generally applicable laws. And until that case is overruled, what people have tried to do is to recast claims that are sort of naturally cast as a religious freedom claim, as a speech claim. Now, it was a little bit harder in the Big Me a, a Cake claim because if you're thinking of pastries, you know, Rembrandt doesn't come most naturally to mind. Um, but ultimately, you know, the court, although it struggled with the question of whether um, forcing somebody to bake you your wedding cake was a form of compelled speech, decided the, quest, uh, the issue in that case on, on another ground and did not deal with the First Amendment question. So five years later, the issue is back in front of the Supreme Court. And this time um, is Lori Smith, who is the owner of 303 Creative. Um, and she is a graphic designer who has a graphic design business and she does websites. So at least we're getting warmer in the speech area. Um, and like the baker, um, she has a religious objection to providing certain services, not all services, to same-sex couples. And so she wants to expand her businesses, she hasn't yet, to same-sex couples, um, and, but she does not, uh, I mean, to uh, wedding websites, excuse me, but she does not want to offer her website business to same-sex couples, only to straight couples. Um, she is in Colorado, the same state as the baker, and they have a very strong public accommodations law. And so fearing that they will uh, come after her as they did with the baker, she files a pre-enforcement challenge. Um, the state, um, perhaps to the dismay of many people afterwards, uh, stipulates to a number of facts that I think were very, very, very key in how the Supreme Court ultimately dealt with the issues in the case, including you know, the fact that she is willing to serve people of all sexual orientations. So if you're a gay person who walks into her shop and you want a website for something else other than a wedding, um, she's more than willing to serve you. Um, and the state crucially also uh, stipulated to the fact that the websites that she would be creating for a couple who's about to be married were her original speech creations. Um, you could sort of conceive of a circumstance in which a state could have argued that in fact it was just the execution of the desires of the couple and not her own speech, but that was sort of stipulated away by the state. It was sort of stipulated that it was her original speech. Um, and so the state goes to the district court in the 10th circuit, she loses. The 10th circuit holds that what is at issue is pure speech and uh, subject to strict scrutiny, but she loses under strict scrutiny. Um, the case goes to the Supreme Court, um, where she went six to three in an opinion by Justice Gorsuch, 
Um, and these two concessions uh, by the state or these two stipulations uh, by the state are sort of key and fundamental in the holding uh, by the court um, that she is in fact willing to serve people of all faiths and creeds and of all sexual orientations and that she has a limited um, uh, uh, objection not to speak uh, for certain um, voices. Uh, and as the court sees, um, you know, the case then, this case falls in the tradition of the flag salute case, you know, the Barnett case, where the state could not make you salute the flag. And it falls in the tradition of the Hurley case, where the court had held um, that a gay group who wanted to participate in, say, in a St. Patrick's Day parade could be excluded by the organizers because it was the organizers on speech. And finally, uh, in the Boy Scout case, where the court had upheld, you know, the right of the Boy Scouts to exclude um, the uh, gay scoutmaster based on their own First Amendment associational rights. Um, you know, there is a very, very spirited, you know, dissent by Justice Sotomayor joined by Justice Kagan and Jackson, um, where there is to some extent a fight with the stipulations that the state entered into and whether this is really a, uh, a case involving speech rather than conduct and whether serving the public is conduct that the state should be able to regulate. And as the case has been widely you know, reported in the press, you know, there has been a fight about whether this is you know, the end of public uh, accommodations laws. Um, it is true that the court has sort of created an expressive ex expression, uh, exception, excuse me, to these sort of laws. On the other hand, I mean, there are a number of hypotheticals that would trouble most fair people. I mean, if you are a left-leaning speech writer, um, can you be and you have a speech writing business? Can you be compelled to work for the Nazi Party or for Donald Trump if that's not your inclination? Uh, can you be compelled to like lend your speech sort of um, crafting abilities to something that you really don't agree? Can you? If you write for a uh, left-wing organization, can you be compelled to write for a right-wing organization and express a point of view you don't, you don't agree with? Um, so there, there are some troubling issues and it is possible that this is in fact sort of more limited than people think. Um, but it is in fact true that it is a big case for the year and only future cases will tell us how far the court will go down this road. Dahlia, I, I think you may have thought. Um, a couple quick uh, uh, notes on, um, I think I want to start by saying I think Miguel is exactly right that a lot of the uh, what's tricky in this case is the stipulations uh, that Colorado enters into. And I think another thing that's very tricky about this case is that it comes as both a religion case and a speech case and religion gets stripped out so that it is treated as a speech case, even though it's almost impossible to unbraid the religious component in the, in the holding of the case. And Lori Smith is very clear that uh, her view is that same-sex marriage is quote, false marriage. That's a religious view. And it's very, very hard, although the court treats it as a pure speech problem to sort of see where religion isn't sort of everywhere and nowhere uh, in this decision. And that makes it slightly fraught. Um, I think, you know, one thing I, I want to say is I think it's absolutely true what Miguel says. This is treated as a sort of pre-enforcement challenge. It's also, I think, a case in which there's no one on the other side, that unlike Jack Phillips in the Masterpiece Cake Shop, where we had actual plaintiffs who were refused service in the face of Charlie Craig and Dave Mullins, who were not allowed to have their wedding cakes, here there's nobody. There's only one party whose story is told in this suit and the invisible parties who have not yet approached her for services. And as a consequence, I think you get a sort of lopsided narrative uh, where the only perceived harm is the harm to the um, uh, 
website designer, there's no other party to claim a uh, dignitary interest. And so I think Justice Sotomayor writing this very, very sharp, as Miguel says, dissent has to try to give voice to all of the perceived people who will be refused services. Uh, the other thing that I think is worth saying is that it's very hard, and I think Miguel makes this point, to find a principled limiting principle here. And this is the bulk of Justice Sotomayor's concern is A, how do we determine what is expressive uh, under this new analysis? If you're gonna have a carve out uh, from public accommodations law, it has never existed, who is to say whether a photographer uh, who is to say whether a florist? We have this week a hairdresser in Michigan who is claiming that uh, haircutting is a bespoke expressive uh, First Amendment uh, protected activity. And there's really, I don't think, much of a clue uh, from majority opinion how we're going to draw that line. Uh, the other really deeply concerning thing that I think Justice Sotomayor lifts up is that all of these public accommodation statutes that were created um, in order to protect people from discrimination on the basis of race, it's hard to find a principal distinction that doesn't sweep in. And the example that Justice Sotomayor gives is the photographer who comes to take class pictures and doesn't think that interracial marriages are real marriages, that they're false marriages and has a principled religious objection to taking those photos. And so it's hard to see how all of the analysis in the race discrimination cases that really form the spine of public accommodations doctrine don't also get implicated here. And I always remind people that when you look at those denials of service to African-American customers at restaurants uh, in the 1960s, race was often lifted up as the basis, race, uh, not race, religion was lifted up as the basis for those denials. Religion was at the heart of the original uh, opinion in Loving versus Virginia. Uh, so I think it's very, very hard to strip that out of this case. And maybe the very last thing uh, I want to say is where um, Justice Sotomayor ends up, and it's where uh, Miguel started, which is this is a really remarkable moment. Uh, we are not in the line of cases that is compelled speech, you know, Hurley, uh, uh, Barnett, because these are ultimately commercial businesses who hang out a shingle and say, we will serve all comers. And now after today, you can also put up a sign on your website that says, we will serve all comers except for gay couples. That is remarkable in terms of a departure or a carve out mm -hmm. and using compelled speech as the vehicle to do that. It is a sea change, and I agree with Miguel, it's going to be left to the courts now to determine how we apply that and whether we can find those sort of principled end, end sort of uh, uh, points. But I don't think this is a trivial case, and I do feel very, very strongly that the absence of anyone on the other side of this case meant that there was really only one compelling story told. So we will perhaps be discussing this issue in future panels, perhaps next year in Philadelphia. Um, I wanna move on now to two of the highest profile cases of the term involving the role of race in college admissions. One was a challenge to UNC's uh, admissions policies. One was a challenge to Harvard's admissions policies. The cases when the court granted review were consolidated for oral arguments and unconsolidated because of Justice Jackson's uh, recusal and then con effectively consolidated again for the court's opinion. Um, so Fred is going to walk us through that. Thanks so thank much. You. Thank you. And uh, thank the ADL and the National Constitution Center and all of my colleagues. It's a great joy to be back together uh, for this program this year. Uh, the Harvard and University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill affirmative action cases were among the most closely watched nationwide and certainly for ADL, which participated with one of the many, many amicus briefs that were put before the court. This is the fourth major time the court going back uh, till 1978 has revisited this issue of race conscious admissions policies in higher education, Bakke in 1978, 
the Gruder case in University of Michigan in 2003, the Fisher case in University of Texas in 2016, and now in 2023, involving a public school, the University of North Carolina, a private institution, Harvard, uh, and asking the question of whether race-conscious admissions is constitutional under the 14th Amendment for public schools, legal under Title VI for private schools, uh, for schools that accept federal funding. That's about 3,000 colleges and universities in this country, but for context, if you combine those two categories, public schools and private schools that accept federal funding, that's about 97% of the 18 million or so students in higher education institutions in the United States. So the impact is dramatic. The facts of this case are well known uh, in part because it's been so widely discussed and in part because this issue has come before the court so many times. Uh, ever since Bakke, uh, no school has had a strict quota that would not be legal for students of color or any particular group. Uh, race cannot be the determining factor in an admissions decision, but it has been a factor in a, in a process. Both University of North Carolina and Harvard included race as a factor in a complex, uh, sophisticated process of winnowing down a large number of applicants into the students actually admitted. In a majority opinion written by the Chief Justice, and this is one of the examples that Erwin talked about earlier of the Roberts Court, this has been an issue associated with this Chief Justice since he had his confirmation hearings back in 2005. The court struck down the use of race as a factor of any kind in admissions and asserted a race-blind view of the Constitution. The Chief Justice, in his majority opinion for six justices, traces back to Brown against Board of Education in the cases that follows a sense of the Equal Protection Clause having a core purpose to do away with all governmentally imposed discrimination on the basis of race. We said, uh, as, as Greg mentioned earlier, this was not a term where the court was going to overrule cases expressly. And in fact, the court does not overrule the Grutter case, although Justice Thomas in his concurrence says that's actually, in fact, uh, what the court is doing. And Justice Thomas does seem to have the better of that for all intents and purposes. Grutter does not seem to survive this decision uh, in these affirmative action cases. It's a Roberts-like approach uh, instead, not to overrule a case, but to look at the body of cases in this area and to divine three principles that are required to justify admissions decisions on the basis of race. And the majority finds that University of North Carolina and Harvard fail on each of the three counts. First, that the program has to comply with strict scrutiny. Second, that it may never use race as a stereotype or as a negative factor. And third, that there has to be some kind of a end date to this project of using race as a factor in admissions. Let me just touch on each of those three. With respect to strict scrutiny, the majority was very concerned that the compelling state interests that had been proffered, training leaders, expanding knowledge from diverse perspectives, creating a robust marketplace of ideas, what we at Phi Beta Kappa like to say, preparing students for meaningful lives, productive lives, and engaged lives as citizens. All of those kinds of factors, the majority found too vague and too unmeasurable for purposes of meaningful judicial review. The majority also felt strict scrutiny was not satisfied because they found that there was no meaningful connection between the means that the schools had employed and that the goals that they were pursuing, specifically, there was mentioned that the racial categories used by both schools, Harvard and Chapel Hill, the majority felt was overbroad, grouping together, for example, all Asian ethnicities into one category uh, or using the category of Hispanic, uh, which in fact comprises uh, many subgroups. So the court felt that strict scrutiny was not satisfied. The, the court uh, majority also felt that race was being used as a negative factor uh, and here in a, in a finding that was somewhat puzzling to those of us who've been involved in the admissions business, uh, the court took a position that college admissions is a strict zero sum game. If one receives a benefit of any kind, another has lost as if it came down to two candidates otherwise identical being decided between based on one factor. And those who've done college admissions knows, know that in fact, that is not how admissions processes work. Uh, but the court found that Race was a negative factor if it advantaged one, by implication on the zero-sum theory of admissions, it would be disadvantaging others. 
Justice, Chief Justice Roberts also felt that there was negative stereotyping engaged. Uh, let me use his language. Uh, it engages in the offensive and demeaning assumption that students of a particular race, because of their race, think alike. As to the logical endpoint, the court found that the schools had not provided any kind of a benchmark to measure when meaningful representation in a diversity uh, had been achieved on a college campus and would no longer require racial conscious admissions practices. There are a number of observations one can make uh, from this case. Let me very briefly touch on three. One is an issue that Erwin mentioned uh, in his introductory remarks. Where does this leave academic freedom? One of the core places where the court has developed its jurisprudence of academic freedom over the past half century has been in the context of race conscious admissions. One of the four core principles of a university's right of academic freedom has been how it comprises its class, the other being who teaches at the institution, what they teach, and how they teach it. Chief Justice Roberts cuts back on that. He says, it is true that our cases have recognized the tradition of giving a degree of deference to a university's academic decisions, but the deference, he says, exists within constitutionally prescribed limits and does not imply an abandonment of judicial review. As the Chief Justice said, universities can define their mission as they see fit. Our mission is defined by the Constitution. To a certain extent, academic freedom survives, but I think academic freedom took a hit here in terms of a limited deference to institutions of higher learning. The second issue I would touch on is the particularly sharp exchange between the two African-American justices on the court, Justice Thomas in his concurrence, Justice Jackson in her dissent. They represent fundamentally different views of race and the law. Justice Thomas articulating a race-blind constitution based on his originalist reading of the text. Justice Jackson uh, saying now famously, I think, deeming race irrelevant in law does not make it so in life. Uh, she says further in her dissent, lengthy history of state-sponsored race-based preferences in America causes the well-documented intergenerational transmission of inequality that still plagues our citizenry. She felt the majority opinion did not take account of that profound impact of past discrimination. Finally, the majority opinion by the Chief Justice does seem to leave two doors open. One, in direct response to a question that Justice Jackson asked during oral argument, when she very uh, uh, pointedly asked about the irony of the fact that a legacy student who benefited from discrimination in the past could mention that, whereas a student whose ancestors have been excluded from the school on the basis of race discrimination could not mention that. So the Chief Justice says near the end of his opinion, nothing in this opinion should be construed as prohibiting universities from considering an applicant's discussion of how race affected his or her life, be it through discrimination, inspiration, or otherwise. I suspect there will be litigation going forward, probably starting already, as to how broad or narrow that language should be interpreted. Finally, another door left open is the military. The majority opinion expressly does not deal with the argument made by the Biden administration in its brief with respect to military programs of race conscious admissions on the basis of the need to develop diverse leadership core within the military. The majority said in a footnote that the court would not weigh on this, in on this issue in light of the potentially distinct interests that military academies may present. Not clear exactly why that difference is different from other academic freedom differences. This may be an issue we see in future cases as well. Greg, you argued in the Supreme Court twice defending the University of Texas's admissions policies. So we'd love to hear your thoughts on these decisions. Great, thank you. Um, so this is the result that pretty much everyone expected, I think, when the court agreed to hear these cases. And we're gonna talk about a few decisions where the court reached somewhat surprising results for the liberals, but this is one where the sort of six, three strong conservative court held and shows that when you know push comes to shove on the most important issues to the conservatives, um, the conservatives are gonna come together um, in a six, three decision if you were gonna to put together a, a sort of wish, wish list for conservatives of issues to re-examine, certainly affirmative action would have been high on the list. Um, I, I think you know, there's a really interesting contrast between 
the decision in this case and the decision in Dobbs last term. Uh, and Dobbs, the Chief Justice, was on his own in saying, look, all we need to do in this case is uphold the Mississippi law. We don't need to actually overrule Roe versus Wade, so let's just do that. Uh, and in this case, by con contrast, the court stopped short of formally overruling its prior precedents in Grutter and Fisher. Um, instead, it, it simply picked what it liked from those cases and ignored the stuff that it didn't like. Um, and, and so I, I think, you know, this sort of less aggressive and you know, arguably less transparent approach is, is a win for the chief. And I, although I think it remains to be seen, you know, whether it's really um, better for the law, but, but the bottom line is that the court stopped short of overruling Bruder and Fisher and in Fisher's case, at least expressly distinguished it. I think this is a really important symbolic win for conservatives. But I think the practical importance of this case um, is less clear. Um, as, as Fred indicated, um, this decision does not require race-blind admissions. Um, the Chief Justice at the end of his decision explicitly said that nothing in the decision prevents um, the consideration of applicants' race in the context of a discussion of his or her own individual experiences. And you know what that really comes down to is taking race as checked as a box into account versus race as it bears on one's individual experiences. And so I expect that we will see that. It'll be interesting to see the extent to which universities um, may uh, encourage that. Um, schools can still pursue holistic admissions. They can seek diversity through race neutral means. Um, and this is an area where schools have gotten more creative recently. They can, um, they can go after financial means first-generation students, languages spoken at home, target students from particular lower-income areas, enact things like Texas had top 10% plan. Um, all of those things may be ways to help offset the impact of this decision. Uh, it has to be said that when uh, Michigan and California prohibited by state laws the consideration of race in their public schools, um, the numbers of uh, African-American and Hispanic students um, in the immediate after that um, fell rather sharply. Um, you know, there's debate about that in this case about the extent to which they've come up, but I think they have come up a bit. And so I, I think that that is something to follow. Uh, as Fred mentioned, um, the, the court also distinguish military academies. So I think there are ways that schools can uh, respond to this decision and, and still seek to pursue diversity. And that all of that, will uh, result, I think, in the next frontier, at which will be litigation over whether schools have permissibly done indirectly what this decision forbids them from doing directly. And the chief, while on the one hand noting that schools could consider race as uh, in the context of one's individual experiences, also said that we're not saying that you can um, do indirectly what we say you can't do directly, uh, and I think, you know, that that's where the litigation is going to head. And, you know, one, I think, of the more important aspects of this decision is a chart in the decision, which shows the remarkable consistency in numerical bands among races. And my sense is that that, that could be important in future cases and in subsequent challenges to for policies that don't expressly consider race as a standalone factor. Um, but nevertheless um, produce classes that may be similar to what we've seen. So a lot remains to be seen in terms of how this decision will shake out as a practical matter, but no question it was very important as a symbolic win for conservatives. Thanks, Greg. We are now about to move on to the part of the program where we discuss the cases uh, in which we saw arguably surprising results. And we are gonna start with Moore versus Harper and the so-called independent state legislature theory. And Miguel is going to introduce that for us. Great, thank you. Um, so this one starts with a dispute about the congressional map that was adopted by the North Carolina uh, legislature in 2021. The legislature is controlled by the Republicans and to no one's great shock, it turned out that the map they came up with gave 10 out of 14 seats to the Republicans. Um, you know, the Democrats cried foul and claimed that this was a partisan gerrymander. 
um, a claim that, as you may recall from the Rucho case in the Supreme Court, is not justiciable in the federal courts. Luckily, the state courts are open and available, so they rushed into the state courts where the North Carolina Supreme Court, which at that time was controlled four to three by the Democrats, um, discovered in the state constitution that the claim is justiciable under the North Carolina constitution and invalidated the map, leading ultimately at the trial court to the adoption of a 7-7 map um, for the 2022 election. Um, the North Carolina legislature Republicans, not giving up, um, took the fight to the U.S. Uh, Supreme Court on the basis of the elections clause of Article One of the Constitution. Um, now, the elections clause um, basically says that um, the times, places, and manners of congressional elections shall be prescribed in each state by the legislature thereof. Um, this has led to this so-called independent legislature theory which basically says that the legislature gets to call um, these things having to do with elections, including the congressional map in this case, um, without really any interference from any other organ of state government, including the state courts, you know, the Supreme Court in this case, um, or the governor or any, um, any other state actor. Um, there is a related argument as it, you know, relate to the presidential elections that is based in Article 2 of the Constitution, the Electors Clause, which says that each state may appoint electors to the Electoral College in such a manner as the legislature thereof may direct. Um, those of you with long memories um, may, you know, recall that, you know, this argument played some role in uh, the arguments in the now very old Bush versus Gore case, where it got three votes from the then sitting justices, um, Rehnquist, Scalia, and Thomas, and we'll come back to that. So the case gets to, gets to the Supreme Court of the United States, where the first um, question uh, is mootness, because in the intervening 2022 elections, the North Carolina State Supreme Court has flipped five to two to the Republicans, who have promptly overruled, you know, the case that um, the four three. Democrats um, had um, used to invalidate, you know, the map and have, you know, dismissed the um, the, the case, or, or or so they thought. Um, they did not, however, they need better lawyers, reinstate the congressional map, and so the Supreme Court, in an opinion by Justice Roberts, um, finds that the case is not moot because even though um, you know the case uh, has been overruled. And um, you know the plaintiffs have effectively been <laughs> dismissed in the state courts. The Supreme Court can provide effective, you know, relief to um, the state court uh, legislature if they win by reinstating the 2021 uh, map. Um, going on to the merits, however, uh, the Supreme Court, um, in an opinion by the Chief Justice, finds that the so-called independent state legislative theory has no legs. And the reasons for these are both uh, based on common sense and on the Supreme Court's own case law. Um, you know, what the court says is that it has already repeatedly considered earlier challenges in which some flavors of this theory had been tendered to the court. Um, in the early 1920s, you know, there was a case um, in which um, uh, in the state of Ohio called Hildebrandt, in which the state constitution in Ohio provided that the state map or the state law that had been approved by the legislature could be overruled in effect by a popular referendum that had been challenged under the elections clause, the Supreme Court of the United States rejected that challenge. Um, later on, you know, there was a uh, challenge in which, you know, the governor had exercised a veto um, and, uh, you know, the Supreme Court of the United States again held that that was consistent with the elections clause and therefore so somewhat inconsistent with the notion that the legislature alone gets the sole say on this. And finally, most recently, uh, the people of Arizona had changed their system to provide that, um, you know, the electoral maps would be sort of um, drawn up by an independent commission rather than by the, by the legislature that had been challenged by the legislature um, and the Supreme Court had upheld that as well. 
What the Chief Justice drew from that is that the election clause basically assigns these duties and effect to the legislative power of the state um, as, as it may be confined by the, own, uh, by the own constitution of the state and that the state cannot say that the legislature alone gets to exercise this independent of the restraints that its own constitution may impose or other lawful you know, restraints. Caveat, which was sort of followed up by Justice Kavanaugh in a concurrence, um, the Chief Justice did say, of course, there is a federal law that could conceivably underlie an exercise by a state court of authority in this area. It is possible, hypothetically, that a state court could exercise such an outlandish mode of you know, review in an elections case that is no longer basically exercising either a judicial function or, or plausibly construing what the electoral code of the state actually does. And in those cases, just as in a case involving a taking of property, where the state says this is not property at all, there would be a federal role for the federal court. Um, and so he holds that out. In a concurring opinion, um, Justice Kavanaugh points out that there is a standard to that that has been voiced by the concurring opinion in Bush versus Gore under the electors clause of Article Two, and he signals that as something that will be available in future cases. Important footnote here, you might think um, that if on the first go around when the North Carolina court had essentially you know, discovered that these claims were justiciable under the state constitution, perhaps to the surprise and consternation of other people in the state, you might have had a good claim that this is one of the circumstances in which the state court has departed from its proper role under the elections clause and there was a federal role to undertake. The chief justice said, well, that may well be, but the state legislature did not raise that claim separately. They did not preserve it and it is waived. So, you know, the court did not address whether the conduct of the court here in with respect to the particular claim was in fact within the elections clause. It said that the exercise of judicial power was appropriate without looking at the claim itself. There was a, a dissent uh, by Justice Thomas Alito and uh, basically, you know, disputing mostly, you know, whether, whether the case was moot. Sorry, mute and mute. Um, Fred? Just a couple of brief, brief notes. Uh, I think Miguel is correct that the, uh, the arguments uh, about the uh, invalidity of the independent legislature theory, uh, both based on common sense or the common sense reading of the test, uh, tests and precedent, uh, were, were clear here, and I think that drives the result to a large extent. There are a couple of things that are worth noting. Uh, one is that uh, those uh, with, with long memories in a different way uh, will recall the, the famous language in Bush v. Gore, uh, that said our consideration is limited to the present circumstances. It was the, uh, the ticket good for only one ride, as was said at the time. Well, it seems that that ticket still lives and rides on, to continue the pun. So exactly what the vitality continuing forward of Bush against Gore is going to be uh, is, is interesting after this case. The fact that Justice Kavanaugh, in his separate opinion, uh, relies on that itself is noteworthy. He, of course, was quite involved as a uh, as a litigant, as an advocate in the Bush wow. against Gore case, and, and perhaps some other people on the Zoom as well. Um, so uh, that, there, that, is, that is certainly worth watching. Um, in addition, uh, and this is something that Justice Thomas points out in his opinion, uh, after saying that the case should not have been taken up as moot and we should let it go at that, he decides, of course, not to let it go at that and does discuss the merits. But one of the things that he does talk about uh, is that at the same time, as this is a elevation of the role of state judiciaries in the face of an argument that legislatures and legislatures alone can make these decisions, it is a big power grant to federal courts. Uh, and you have this, this odd blend of federal and state function of state institutions uh, using state law to evaluate state activities that is delegated by the federal constitution. So there is a federal issue involved as well, uh, which does lead to the concern of when federal courts get involved in the 
uh, the, the play out of elections, particularly if it's not ex ante, but it's right during the election uh, or immediate aftermath, uh, raising serious questions. And again, those of us who remember Bush against Gore, uh, re remember that as in many ways not being the court's finest hour. I want to turn now to what was arguably the other big surprise of the term, which was the court's decision in Allen versus Milligan, the Alabama Voting Rights Act case, and Dahlia is going to cover that for us. And, I, and I'm going to do it uh, at a gallop, Amy, because I feel like we have so much uh, ground left to cover. So I'll try to. I will Hands or gallop, it. whatever you'd like. I will. I will do the 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 Acela version of this. Um, and and I just want to make just two precatory points. One is to the extent that last term was really consumed with issues of abortion and guns and religion. This term was meant to be kind of the referendum on race. Um, and as you've just heard in the affirmative action cases, uh, that was a huge win uh, uh, for a sort of conservative uh, colorblind view uh, in the Indian Child Welfare Act case, which we're going to get to if I talk faster, and uh, in this voting rights arena, it was in fact not uh, borne out by uh, the end of the term. And I think that um, using sort of Irwin's construction, which is there were a lot of wins, surprising wins for uh, liberal views this term. I think this was the one that was actually a win uh, and not a status quo decision. This actually was a net uh, huge win. Um, and uh, just very quickly, folks will recall in Shelby County versus Holder in 2013, a divided Supreme Court struck down section five of the Voting Rights Act, which contained that preclearance formula used to determine when state governments had to obtain right approval for changes to their voting laws and practices. Uh, but they could still use Section 2. Two years ago in Brnovich, by a 6 to 3 margin, the court narrowed Section 2. And it looked as though this case would have further narrowed. Uh, the case is Merrill versus Milligan, later renamed Allen versus Milligan. Uh, it would have sort of expanded that uh, idea to vote dilution cases, and it didn't happen. Uh, it was a genuine win for Section 2. Just very briefly, the law at the heart of this case, Section 2, uh, bars election practices that result in a denial or abridgment of the right to vote based on race. In this case, we had voting rights groups challenging Alabama's 2021 redistricting map because seven seats in the House of Representatives uh, uh, had only one uh, Black district, despite the flat fact that Black residents make up 27% of the state's population. Um, and this was done by way of sort of what we know as traditional cracking and packing. Um, and uh, the challengers contended that they had a right to a second majority Black district. Uh, a three-judge panel, uh, including two Donald Trump appointees, ruled that the map violated Section 2. In February of 2022, the Supreme Court, by a 5-4 margin, uh, uh, stayed that and allowed Alabama to use uh, uh, the map in the 2022 elections. The case was set for argument this term. And in a sort of surprising five to four decision authored by the Chief Justice, joined by Brett Kavanaugh, the Supreme Court uh, uh, upheld the idea that uh, the 1986 decision in a case called Thornburg versus Jingles, which outlines a three-part test to evaluate claims under Section 2, uh, had uh, didn't uh, uh, permit the, the new map, which violates the Voting Rights Act. And uh, the Chief Justice is very clear in his opinion. He writes, Alabama's understanding of Section 2 would require abandoning four decades of second Section 2 to precedent, we decline to recast the case law as Alabama requests. Um, there were very, very strong dissents by Justices Thomas and Alito, and I just want to lift up uh, that this really goes to Irwin's larger point that to the extent that last year at this time we were saying this is the Thomas court, this is the Alito court, uh, this was another case in which they wrote uh, dissents. 
I think that the knock on effects is that voting rights groups uh, are going to benefit uh, in terms of not just Alabama voters, uh, but Louisiana and Georgia litigation. Uh, and I think that this is, in some sense, uh, this huge, huge surprise uh, to the court, to the public, uh, in many ways predicted what was going to happen in the affirmative uh, action cases we just discussed. And one tiny little wrinkle is that we're now seeing arguments uh, from Republicans in Louisiana who are challenging Section 2 using the logic of the affirmative action decisions we just discussed. Greg, if you have any quick thoughts on Alan sure. versus Milligan, we'd love to hear them. So I think this case um, underscores that probably the most important in and interesting relationship on the court is between the Chief Justice and Justice Kavanaugh right now. Uh, we have a very strong 6-3 uh, conservative court. What that means is it takes not just one, but two justices to flip the court. And if you put the chief in the middle of the court, that means you've got to find someone else. And this term, at least, it was Justice Kavanaugh who tended to supply that vote. Um, the next point that I think this case illustrates is that this is still very much as uh, Dean Chemerinsky indicated at the beginning of the presentation, the Roberts Court. Um, the chief really had a remarkable year um, writing the most important decisions um, on both the left and the right. And this is one where he um, pulled Justice Kavanaugh to join him. Uh, initially, uh, the court agreed by a 5-4 vote to stay um, implementation of the district court, the plan in this case. And so um, the ultimate 5-4 decision upholding that plan required the chief to pick up a vote. And he did that. And uh, Justice Kavanaugh. I, I think the best way to understand the case is stare decisis, another theme that we've talked about, uh, in particular statutory stare decisis. As Dahlia mentioned, um, the Chief Justice and Justice Kavanaugh viewed Alabama's argument as simply an attack on 40 years of the court's interpretation of Section 2, and they refused to go along with that. And then the last thing I would note is that as important as this win was for the progressives, uh, it's narrow and conceivably limited in time. Uh, Justice Kavanaugh wrote separately as the fifth vote, um, uh, declining to go along with the Chief Justice discussion of the difference between race consciousness and race, racial predominance, which is not permitted, but then also raised the possibility that even if Congress could authorize the use of race in the redistricting con uh, context for some period, perhaps that wasn't an indefinite authorization. Um, and that caveat, I think, is particularly or potentially ominous in the wake of the affirmative action cases in which the court went out of its way to emphasize um, the line in Grutter that they were only allowing this for a limited period of time. So I think that'll be an important feature to watch. Terrific. Thank you. We're going to move on quickly to a pair of cases involving liability by tech companies for content posted by others. So Miguel, if you could talk us through those, please. Well, um, maybe I can do this even uh, faster. Um, these are a pair of cases, both of which came to the Supreme Court from the Ninth Circuit, Gonzalez versus Google and Twitter versus Amnet. Um, the Ninth Circuit sort of engaged in somewhat of an inconsistent disposition of them. Um, but basically what's at issue here underlying this is the Anti-Terrorism Act, under which a U.S. national who's injured by an act of international terrorism may recover travel damages. Um, may also, uh, you know, victims may also, you know, recover from anybody who aids and abets um, by knowingly providing substantial assistance or who conspires with the person who committed such act of international terrorism. So here we had two separate acts of international terrorism, one in Turkey and one in Paris. Families of uh, you know, the victims sued uh, separately, uh, Twitter, Google, and other companies, sort of uh, claiming in essence um, that the social media companies in one case, um, Google had, um, had sort of like uh, aided uh, through YouTube, aided ISIS, uh, under recruitment and ultimately was, you know, responsible for aiding and abetting the act of international uh, terrorism um, because, you know, the algorithm had aided, you know, the recruitment of terrorists by ISIS. Uh, 
and ultimately it had led to uh, you know the victim's you know demise. Uh, you know there were similar allegations in the Twitter case. Uh, you know with respect to uh, Twitter and Facebook and others. Um, uh, in the Google case, you know the Ninth Circuit dismissed most of the case under Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act. And when the case got to the Supreme Court, everybody thought that this was going to be the big issue in the Supreme Court. Uh, Section 230 generally protects internet platforms uh, for making available uh, on their platforms content posted by others. Um, uh, as to Twitter, you know, the Ninth Circuit had held um, that if there were allegations that the defendant had assisted a broader campaign of terrorism, that could be enough to survive, you know, dismissal. Now, the headline in the case is that, you know, the case got to the Supreme Court and to the great, you know, relief and perhaps the concern, you know, of many people and to the consternation of some, the Supreme Court didn't get to anything having to do with Section 230 of the CDA, um, which was why everybody thought these cases were going to be uh, really obviously uh, important and significant, and the court sent that issue back to the lower courts. You know, the court um, uh, wrote its main opinion and an opinion by Justice Thomas in the Twitter case, um, and, you know, the bulk of the opinion is parsing through the statutory language of the ACA, to try to figure out um, what aiding and abetting means. And uh, basically the court held that it means the same thing as in the common law uh, terms. And therefore you have to engage actively in the particular act of terrorism as something that you need to bring uh, about is basically something that the court had said in some of its old case laws. There was a case called Nye and Nizen. Um, and you know there was some ambiguity in the text as to whether you're aiding the, the the organization or the act, but at the end of the day, um, what the court essentially holds is that you have to engage in some kind of the aid, you know, the act with a culpable mental state. Um, and, uh, you know, the court found that there were not enough allegations in, in, uh, in the Twitter case. Um, in the Google case, you know, the court um, found that there might be some conceivable uh, factual um, claims that sort of got past that test, but they were not well treated. But in any event, all of this was sent back to the Ninth Circuit. Um, the holdings of the case, you know, if you ever need a good exposition of the contours of aiding and abetting law, um, Justice Thomas wrote an exhaustive uh, and well researched opinion on this. Um, but as to the issue that everybody was interested on, whether the court was going to cut back or do something about Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act, that was left for another day. Terrific. Thank you. Erwin, any quick thoughts? Real quickly, I think this is important because these are the first cases to come to the Supreme Court about holding social media companies liable. The court didn't do so. At the oral argument, both conservative and liberal justices we're expressing great concern about opening that door. There's been many more cases coming up with regard to social media and the internet. And it'll be interesting to see if the court follows this caution in the future. Yep. If I could just add uh, uh, something that I will say was interesting about how the court chose to analyze what social media is under traditional aiding and abetting law is that as far as the court looked at the question, People who use social media to commit wrongs are not legally different from people who use the mails or the phone to commit wrongs. And although someone might claim that the algorithms and everything else that you know social media use to steer people to one room or to another, as it were, may or should make a difference on the questions of liability, Justice Thomas basically said that that basically was passive nonfeasance. And just as if the phone company becomes aware that you're engaged in wrongdoing, there's generally no general legal duty for them to stop giving you the service. Um, absent proof that you know these algorithms are anything other than part of the architecture that is essentially passive in this media, they're basically like the wires in the phone. Um, it is a service that's being provided, but it doesn't itself give rise to liability. Thank you so much. I want to move on to student loans, and so I'm going to toss it to toss it to Fred. In the student loan cases, we see several of the themes we've been talking about uh, this afternoon. 
We see a uh, strong opinion by the Chief Justice. We see a 6-3 court, and we see something Erwin told us at the very beginning, a uh, lack of deference here to the political branches, the executive branch and the legislative branch. Uh, at issue was the Biden administration's uh, issuance of debt, student debt relief of uh, $10,000 for students making $125,000 or less, or up to $20,000 of debt relief for those who are Pell Grant eligible have been Pell Grant recipients. Total price tag of this package uh, was over $400 billion, estimated about $430 billion. That becomes an important issue in oral argument, and we see that come up in the opinion as well. Two sets of issues in these cases. One is standing. Uh, we're briefly, in one of the cases brought by the private plaintiffs, the court in unanimous opinion by Justice Alito. Um, that's interesting. That's the first time we've mentioned Justice Alito here, where we talked about him a lot last year. There's a story to be told in that as well. He writes a 9-0 opinion saying that there was not standing of the private plaintiffs who had been denied debt relief under this plan. But the case brought by six states, the Chief Justice writes the opinion saying there is standing. This is in spite of the fact, as the administration argued and as Justice Kagan argued in a very strongly worded dissent, that the party that really stood to be harmed by this debt relief program was an independent state agency of Missouri, which was not a party. And that's not accidental. They had not joined the case. Uh, the Chief Justice says, well, they're a state agency and they're connected with the state. That's enough to create standing for the state of Missouri and therefore give standing for the six states that brought this uh, allowing the court to reach the merits. On the merits, the administration had used the HEROES Act, passed back in 2003, which, among other things, provided the Secretary of Education with the authority to waive or modify student loan obligations, student debt obligations, uh, in connection with military operations or other national emergencies. That's the operative language here. Uh, Congress never modified that. Congress could have dropped the or national emergencies language. They didn't, and of course, Congress didn't repeal this act. Chief Justice Roberts, in the majority opinion, said that language was not sufficient to authorize the debt relief of $430 billion here under the continuing use of the major questions doctrine. There was something of this level, this magnitude is involved. It requires more direct authorization from Congress, and that this was uh, to use the language from last year's case, uh, EPA in West Virginia, uh, oblique and elliptical in the statute rather than direct. Justice Kagan, uh, in her dissent, says the language was actually quite clear and that it does authorize debt relief waiver uh, or modification. In this case, there was waiver, and that was the authority that was used. Uh, she pulls together our two questions in this case and says that the taking of the case where there was not standing is a judicial overreach, and the rejection of the administrative action based on what she finds to be a clear authorization in the statute is also judicial overreach. Interestingly enough, it was Justice Scalia who years ago talked about standing as the bulwark against judicial overreach and the limitation on self-governance. Erwin, can you tell us please about Holland versus Burkine? Of course. There's a long tragic history in the United States of Native American children being removed from their families. Congress adopted the Indian Child Welfare Act to address this. It says that when placing Native American children in foster care adoption, a preference should be given for Native American families. This case, Burkina versus Halland, is actually three that came to the Supreme Court together. The name case, Burkina versus Halland, is typical. The Burkins are a white family that took a Native American child into foster care. After a year together, they decided they want to adopt the child. Both of the biological parents, both enrolled members of tribes, agreed to the adoption to be the child's best interests. But one of the tribes objected, saying that they had a Native American family in another state to adopt the child. The Burkins then brought a challenge to the constitutionality of the Indian Child Welfare Act. The district court struck it down on many grounds, the Fifth Circuit affirmed in part, and the Supreme Court granted review. The Supreme Court in a seven to two decision upheld the Indian Child Welfare Act, but left some of the key questions unresolved. Justice Barrett wrote the opinion for the court. She said Congress had the power to adopt the Indian Child Welfare Act. Congress has broad plenary power with regard to Indian affairs. She rejected the argument that the Fifth Circuit accepted, 
that this was impermissible commandeering of the states. She said states are obligated to follow federal law. But a key issue in the case is whether the Indian Child Welfare Act is an impermissible racial preference. The Fifth Circuit had split evenly on that question in an en banc decision. Justice Barrett writing for the court said that neither Texas nor the families had standing in this case, and therefore the court was not going to address it. Justice Kavanaugh wrote a separate opinion saying he thought this was a racial preference. There's two ways to characterize the preference of Native American families. One, as Justice Kavanaugh did, is to say it's a racial preference. Then in all likelihood, the Supreme Court would strike it down in accord with the affirmative action cases we discussed earlier. The other is to see it a preference based on political affiliation. Native American tribes are sovereigns. And then it's likely to be upheld. This issue is now going to be litigated in the lower courts and come back to the Supreme Court. My sense is there are four justices who will say it's a political affiliation and uphold the preference. Justices Gorsuch, Sotomayor, Kagan, and Jackson. The question is whether they'll have a fifth vote for that perspective, and that's ultimately to determine the constitutionality in Child Welfare Act. So for now, the law is upheld, even emphatically, but the crucial question is left for the future. Thanks so much, Erwin. We are almost out of time, and we want to get to at least a couple of questions, but um, quickly, perhaps at a gallop, Dahlia and Greg, what are you looking for for next term? Um, I, I, a couple things. We, we've barely touched on it, but I think there is this overarching other story this term around um, public opinion polling, the legitimacy of the court. It's worth noting that the term opened with Justices Kagan and Chief Justice Roberts uh, uh, taking swipes at one another over how to think about and talk about the legitimacy questions of the court. Um, the term ended that way uh, in the student loan cases. So it's an interesting bracketing effect where in some sense there is a very, very uh, loud, silent conversation going on amongst the justices about how we talk about legitimacy in front of the children, um, the children being us in this instance. And I think we can't flinch from the fact that the Dobbs case had a huge, huge uh, effect on the 2022 midterms and that organizing around the court continues to be an issue. And all that is separate and apart, Amy, from just the absolute conflagration of ethics questions that have arisen this year as a result of reporting by ProPublica, The Washington Post, uh, Politico and other places. So all that is both part of this conversation and separate from this conversation, but it's very, very much something. And we're now looking at, you know, a markup of a bill that's impending that would impose uh, requirements on the justices to uh, change their ethics practices. So this is really uh, a, a, an essential issue. I know it's worthy of its own discussion, but it's happening. And then before I turn it over to Greg, I will say um, only that next term, the court is also going to take a long look at the Chevron doctrine, how much we defer to agencies and their interpretations of uh, their own regulations. It could be the end of the Chevron doctrine. And there's a massive gun case that the court uh, granted cert on the last day of, uh, of the term uh, that has to do with the gun rights of people who are subject to domestic uh, 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 violence uh, orders that may lift up an issue that the court sort of plopped on us last term and didn't explain, which is what is the scope now of the Second Amendment right to, to bear arms and how much text in history can determine uh, whether we can have a, a gun restriction. So there's a lot coming and it's all in some sense uh, uh, shadowed by a public sense that the court is behaving like a partisan political body. So I think just, just briefly, I think what we saw this term in the main is that the court in the aftermath of Dobbs and what are, I think, you know, fairly unprecedented attacks on the legitimacy of the court, you know, at least some of which probably are fairly well orchestrated from the left to try to restrain the court, you know, had had seem to have had some moderating effect on the court in some of the cases. And so, and on some of the justices, particularly the chief and, and Justice Kavanaugh. And so I think looking ahead, 
um, one of the main areas to think about is whether or not that will continue or whether or not the court will instead sort of tack back more strongly to the right. The other thing I would mention to pick up on one of the points that Dean Chemerinsky made at the outset is that um, there are only 22 cases on the court's docket for uh, next term right now, which is an unprecedentedly low number. So while the court's total cases has plummeted, the court nevertheless is continuing to take um, divisive, controversial cases, as Dahlia mentioned. They're going to take up a question of whether to overrule Chevron. They're um, going to be active again in the area of uh, the administrate more administrative state more generally, considering um, the constitutionality of uh, agency proceedings against individuals. And they're going to take up voting rights again in the context of a South Carolina um, map and a, another challenge based on race there. So there will be no sh shortage of things to talk about next, next year, to be sure. Fantastic, thank you. I want to touch on, we have one, time for one question that touches on something that we haven't really talked about except in passing, which is a question near and dear to Steve Vladek's heart, which is what is the ongoing role of the shadow docket at the court these days and has it affected this year's ruling? Uh, anyone want to answer the, the Steve Laddick shadow docket question? Channel Steve. I can just say very, very quickly that Steve would be the first person for folks who um, aren't following this closely. Um, Steve and several other people uh, at the beginning of last term uh, were very concerned about the number of cases that were being decided on the emergency docket without full merits briefing and sometimes without um, signed opinions and much guidance of what was happening um, and whether or not the shadow docket is a nefarious term we can leave to another day. Uh, but Steve, I think, would probably be the first to say um, that one of the things that we did see this year, and I think it's of a piece with what Greg is saying about ways in which uh, the court has pumped the brakes on some of this, much, much less reliance on doing things on the shadow docket and a real attempt to course correct and to not do things uh, at midnight in three sentence orders. So this is, I see this as an example of the court trying really hard to be responsive to a public criticism. And on the other hand, we have seen concomitantly a growth of something that we, we would have thought extraordinary only a few years ago, which is a skyrocketing on the number of cert before judgment grants. I mean, if you look at the, uh, the number of times where actually just pretty much everyone thinks nothing of asking for cert you know, before judgment and the court takes it. Uh, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, that would have been unheard of. And now it's, you're almost engaged in, you know, malpractice in front of the court if you don't think of asking for that. Anyone else? Well, thank you everyone for a really, truly amazing panel. It was so wonderful to sit here and listen to you all talk about the term. I wish we had, we could have done it for another few hours. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks to everyone for joining us. Hope you have a wonderful day.